hung in the foyer of the church. The plaque was covered with names and a small American flag was mounted on each side. The seven-year-old boy had been staring at the plaque for some time, and so the pastor walked up and stood beside him and said quietly, Good morning, Alex. How are you this morning? Good morning, Pastor, replied the young man, still focused on the plaque. Pastor McGee, what is this? Alex asked the pastor that day. Well, son, it's a memorial to all the men and women who died in the service. Soberly, they stood together, staring at the large plaque. Little Alex's voice was barely audible and cracking when he finally managed to ask the pastor this question. Which one? The 10 a.m. service or the 6 p.m. service? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I hope no one dies in this service here this morning, and uh, physically or spiritually, in Jesus' name. <laughs> but, uh, the, you know, out of the mouths of babes, right? We always hear, they say the, uh, as they say, there's been television show, they say the strangest and the craziest things. Amen? <laughs> and if you've had a child, why don't you just say amen? Because I know they've said some, they've probably embarrassed you a couple of times, right? <laughs> Can we stand here this morning and go to the word of the Lord? Amen. We stand to honor his reading, the reading of the word. That is why it is our tradition here at Firstborn Ministries to stand to honor the word. Now, we don't do this every Sunday. There are some times when the pastor or senior pastor or minister might just go right into his sermon. Uh, and he might just ask that we remain seated. And that's okay too. But whenever we start out with a text, we like to stand to honor the reading of God's Word. I want to honor the Word of God. Amen? In my life. Before we do that, though, Cassandra Wilson, come on up. I know she, There she is. She was baptized in Jesus' name. And also Shane, come on up. Baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. Baptized in his name. Amen. God bless them. I'm excited to see what God is going to do in their lives. Amen. This is just a beginning, just a start of what God wants to do in your life. Leviticus chapter number 17. Leviticus chapter number 17 and verse number 11. And then we'll be skipping to the New Testament of Matthew Book of Matthew 26, chapter 26, and verse 28. But first, Leviticus 17, 11, and then Matthew 26, 28. I'll wait for a moment so you can get to that passage. Leviticus 17, verse 11 says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Matthew chapter number 26. Matthew chapter number 26 and verse 28. It says this, For this is my blood, Jesus is speaking here to his disciples, and he says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. You know, as we say often... The wages of sin is death. And only Jesus Christ's blood can pay the price of sin. So I know many in this room understand this. And I hope by the end of this message this morning, we all will understand it. And we'll all remember this blood once again. So for the next few moments this morning, I want to teach and preach or treat, whatever it might be, on this blood, this blood. Can we just raise our hands, put our Bibles down, raise our hands to our Savior, Jesus. We thank you. We praise you for your spirit that we feel in this place. I pray now that you would anoint this vessel. God, I, I pray that I would just be the clay in your hands this morning. I believe you have given me a word for these wonderful people. And I pray now, Lord, that I would be able to speak with boldness, clarity, through the Holy Ghost, the words of life this morning that you have given. And I pray that we would open up the ears of the hearers this morning and the hearts of the hearers and be able to understand once again 
this blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated in Jesus' name. So glad you are here this morning. Good to see all of our guests. Welcome. Good to see some returning uh, family members in this house. God bless you. Welcome. Welcome back. God bless you. We're glad that you come back from vacation, rested, rejuvenated, hopefully, in Jesus' name. The sight of blood invokes mystique in us. The Bright red fluid incites trepidation and fear in some because of its association with injury and death. Blood is a very interesting thing. Now I, myself, I'm not too keen in the sight of blood, while others, even talking about it, makes them feel queasy, and yet others faint at the sight of blood. But I'm thankful for the nurses and doctors and surgeons, that it doesn't bother. And all the blood and gore and guts, whatever it might be, be, they're able to do their job that I believe they were created to do. I believe that God calls more than preachers. God calls more than singers and songwriters. But He calls doctors and lawyers and all in between. It's a calling of God, I believe, on their life. It is a scientific fact that blood from every human being that is in this room is similar in every human being in the world. Yes, we all have certain blood types and some are rarer than others. The blood, though from a white, black, red, or yellow man or woman, can be safely given in transfusion to any other person if the type is right. Because our blood is so similar. The Bible verifies this in Acts chapter 17 and 26. Where Paul said that God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. It brings up something else to my memory. That a lot of stuff that we had to figure out in this life and throughout the history of the world could have been figured out a lot faster if people would have read the Bible and said that it was true. The earth being round wasn't exposed by Christopher Columbus, but by the word of God. Because in Isaiah 40 and 22 says, And it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. And Matthew chapter number 12 and verse 40 says, For as Jonas or Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. If the earth was flat, how can someone be in the heart of the earth? It is true what it says in Psalm 33 and 4, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. In 1628, William Harvey made his amazing discovery of the circuitry system, and up until that point, little had been known about the value of blood to the human life. In fact, before that time, blood was thought to be the source of disease rather than the source of defense against disease. Thus, sick men were often bled to get rid of their diseases. George Washington's death is said to be hastened by bloodletting, as it was called. To some, talking about the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed is viewed as a gory religion. Be that as it may, but the Bible Bible emphatically declares in Hebrews 9 and 22 that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. I am so thankful for all of the blood donors that are in this world. And I'm sure that we have some right here in this room here this morning. And you have saved lives because of that donation. But there is one man who shed his blood one time, and all it took was one time of this blood that was shed to save the entire world. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ, referred to by John as the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. That is why we are in agreement with the songwriter, Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
There is no other blood that is like it. There will be never be any more blood that is like it. It started working at the cross of Calvary, and it hasn't ceased working even today. I want to remind someone on this Sunday morning that there is nothing more powerful, that there is nothing greater, that there is nothing else that can save. There is nothing else that can heal and deliver than this blood, this blood, this blood. This blood can never be talked about enough, and it needs to be the focus of every person that is here today. This blood that was shed by Jesus for the remission of all that would follow his plan. This blood. This blood. See, the Bible is not a science book, but it does reveal some interesting biological facts. One is that life is in the blood. This was written long before the fascinating chemistry and biology of blood was ever known. No wonder God uses blood to typify the substance of redemption in the Old Testament. The blood of animals was shed and their life was forfeited to give life to the Israelite sacrificers. Then Jesus came and provided literal physical blood for our redemption. His loss of blood took his life. But that same blood gives us life. Let me say that again. His loss of blood took his life. But that same blood gives us life. See, there is a scarlet thread running throughout the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. The term scarlet thread comes from the famous story of a scarlet thread, a cord or rope that Rahab hung out her window as as it's recounted in Joshua chapter number 2. The scarlet thread became her means of protection and salvation when the walls came tumbling down. The scarlet thread we are talking about involves a trail of blood which began in Genesis in the Garden of Eden and flowed through every generation and age, touching every book in the Bible all the way to the end of the world predicted in the book of Revelation. This river of blood started with the killing of animals in order to make robes to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve which was revealed by their sin of disobedience. Next we see... We, we, we view Abel's offering and then the altars built by Noah and Job and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the many others. On these altars they sacrificed animals seeking to appease the wrath of a just God against their unrighteousness. In Moses' day God revealed the sacrifice of the Passover lambs and the requirement that people smear the blood on their doorposts and their lintels which provided protection from the death angel that passed through Egypt on the night prior to the Israelites' exodus. Blood had to be applied for them to live through that night, for the firstborn to live through that night. Under the law, the people observed daily sacrifices at the tabernacle and the temple for hundreds of years. Many millions, if not hundreds of millions of animals gave their life's blood to help mankind obtain and maintain a relationship with God. We will talk more about that in just a few moments. However, their blood was unable to reconcile mankind fully to God. They served only to establish a pattern pointing toward a future day in shadow which would be revealed in the day in the New Testament when the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, would shed His blood as the ultimate sacrifice, the only sacrifice that could fully attain or atone for the sins of all humankind. It was blood, but it wasn't this blood, as I'm talking about the animals. It was blood, but it wasn't this blood. All the blood that the animals gave was blood, but not this blood that Jesus gave for all. The bl- this blood is the only blood that you will ever need for salvation. This blood is the only thing needed to redeem your life and your world as you know it. I want to bring you a couple of things that this blood does here this morning. Blood gives the necessity of human life. Again, life is found in the blood. Blood is one of the essential elements of the human body. Without blood, nothing else in the body works. Nothing else lives. All organs and components of the body depend upon the blood to deliver oxygen and nutrients and life itself. It is impossible to live 
without the flow of blood throughout the human body. I want you to consider this for a moment that the heart is an organ that weighs only 12 ounces. It beats an average of 75 times a minute, pumping through itself 45 pounds of blood per minute 2,700 pounds of blood per hour 32.4 tons tons per day every 30 seconds all the blood in the body every 30 seconds all the blood in the body passes through the heart imagine that for a moment I can't even conceive it or imagine it that every 30 seconds I stand up here teaching and preaching my heart is pumping and the blood is continually flowing and passing through my heart every single ounce every single drop of blood that I have every 30 30 seconds is passing through the heart. The blood pumping through our heart does enough work in one hour to lift a 150 pound man to the top of a three story building. It has enough energy in 12 hours to lift a 65 ton tank car one foot off the ground. And it contains enough power in 70 years to lift the largest battleship afloat completely out of the water. It doesn't take a scientific genius or a medical expert to realize that where there is no blood, there is no life. It is the source of life. Not only is it the source of life, but number two is blood has to be respected. Blood is to be highly respected because life itself is in it. As it says in Leviticus 17, when blood ceases to flow through the human body's blood vessels, death is imminent. If the blood cells fail to reach any tissue or cell of our body, that tissue or cell dies. Furthermore, as the precious blood is essential to our physical life and existence, so it is to our spiritual life and eternal life that the shed blood of Jesus Christ is vital to the life of every believer. Blood is important, and God chose to involve blood and the affecting of mankind's redemption what I'm trying to tell you here this morning is that blood is the source of life and has to be respected more than any other human blood is it has to be respected about this blood that I talk about this morning this blood of Jesus is everything you will ever need this blood of Jesus is everything thing that you can ever have as I've said it can cleanse it can heal it can deliver this blood this blood this blood and when the blood starts flowing stops flowing in your life things begin to die off when this blood stops flowing in your heart things begin to die off and backsliding begins to happen blood is not only necessary for the human life but it's also necessary for the heavenly life in other words while our blood gives the necessity of earthly life this blood guarantees the certainty of eternal life this blood guarantees the certainty of eternal life I want to live more than just on this earth because I want to live again. And if I want to live again, I got to have this blood flowing through my veins. If I want to live again on the other side, this is the blood that must wash away my sins. This is the blood that must be applied to my life for the atonement and the redemption power. This blood. This blood. Again, I think of the Passover in Egypt, the final and ultimate plague and sentence of death has been passed upon all the firstborn in the land. However, the only security from death and the only certainty for life was the blood. God said unto Moses, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Death will not come. When I see the blood, you know that one day 
our physical body will die. But really, we only die to live again if the blood is applied to our lives. And only by the blood of Jesus do we have any hope for meeting Him in peace one day. Only if the blood is applied will we see our heavenly Savior one day. My eternal destiny depends on this blood. Your eternal destiny depends on this blood. Jesus paid the sacrificial price for redemption that we could never pay for ourselves. Man's blood can never satisfy divine judgment because of sin. Men's blood is polluted and throughout the veins of humanity flows a poisoned bloodstream. The life of man is born into sin. Nothing can happen in the spiritual with our blood. Our blood calls for judgment rather than appeasement. The shedding of man's blood can only bring God's wrath and not God's mercy. It's kind of like we hear in the Old Testament that God speaks to that young man who had just killed his brother and said, hey, the blood of your brother cries from the ground. It's crying out to me. The blood of Abel is crying out. And he said, God said, the voice of your brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Let me tell you what it was crying out that day. That blood cried vengeance and wrath. It's a blood that must be avenged for. Can you hear the cry of innocent blood today? Can you hear the cry of blood? of people that are shot in Rockford, Illinois and every single weekend, hundreds sometimes and usually in the teens and more killed in Chicago. Can you hear the innocent blood crying out in the streets of our city asking for revenge, looking for revenge? Can you hear the innocent blood of millions of babies aborted and it's crying out it's seeking for revenge that's the blood that I'm talking about in this story before the work of the cross and the, that the, the, this blood that was shed before the work of the cross Paul says that we were all destined for wrath and that we were enemies of God in Ephesians chapter 2 and 12 says that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of the promise having no hope and without God in this world before the death of Jesus Christ we were aliens and strangers and enemies of God the fellowship that man once enjoyed with God had been broken and thus man was separated from God without hope without God in the world and we needed a spotless lamb the man who had no sin to shed his innocent blood and God heard the blood crying out and so he said I'm going to robe myself in flesh and I'm going to step into the world and I'm going to step into your lives and one day in 30, 32 short years or 33 short years I'm going to go to a cross and I'm going to put my arms out and I'm going to shed this blood and the blood won't cry anymore for vengeance this blood won't cry for someone else to take a life this blood will cry freedom this blood will cry redemption this blood will cry holiness for God and to God Hebrews 12, 24 says, And Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Better things than that of Abel. This blood that Jesus said is, again, I've said is crying out this morning. Speaks to men and women in this room. Grace and mercy. And freedom in your life. What you're feeling even now is. That is resting upon you as I feel the conviction. The convicting power of God is resting on men and women's life. It is trying to come to speak better things in your life. The blood of this world has been speaking Negative and terrible things in your life. 
But Jesus has come with this blood that's crying out remission and healing and forgiveness. As I have said, throughout all time, starting at the fall from the garden until the cross, and even after, how men and women were cleansed with the blood of the sacrifice. The idea of seeing animals slaughtered in our contemporary worship services is foreign to Western Christianity. It is hard for us to imagine so much bloodshed associated with worshiping God. Because we can't see it with our eyes. The very mention of animal sacrifices brings to mind pagan and heathen religions. However, the shedding of blood was central to the Old Testament. And the Old Testament worship. Its purpose established the pattern that Christ eventually fulfilled. And although in the present church age, the actual slaying of animals and the sprinkling of blood has ceased... Because the ultimate lamb has come. The principles of sacrifice and offerings are still in effect. However, now it is the blood of Jesus Christ that covers our sins. One sacrifice performed for all and forever effective. This blood that Christ shed at Calvary is still effectual today. It still works today. And of, of, and of the 613 commandments in the Pentateuch. If you're wondering what that is, it consists of the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Of the 102 commandments given in those books, of various details of sacrifices, and more than 100 other laws provide instructions to the priesthood and rituals associated with the sacrificial system. The Old Testament worship always included a sacrifice. However... The animals, the sacrifices, were always considered a substitute. Never the real thing. Looking forward in faith to the future ultimate sacrifice that could actually cure the sin problem. It wasn't this blood in the Old Testament. It wasn't the blood that Jesus said, this blood will remit your sins. There, think about it, the tabernacle and the temple this morning. Think about the daily sacrifices that were burnt every morning and evening. Double on the Sabbath. Ten more times on the monthly new moon. On all the feast days, including the days of the unleavened bread, feast of weeks, feast of tabernacles, the list of prescribed offerings, the total for the year added up to 1,300 animals that were sacrificed. 1,104 lambs, 116 bullocks, 49 rams, and 31 goats. In addition, the personal sacrifices of individuals added many more animals to be slain. At Passover, over a quarter million lambs were slain. One for every family in the nation. Then at the Feast of the Tabernacles, another quarter million bullocks were slain for the family peace offerings. And to all this, the individual burnt offerings and trespass offerings and the sin offerings for the people. And the temple altar must have seemed like a stockyard slaughterhouse. So much animal blood was shed. At the time of Christ, when Herod was remodeling the temple, the altar, it says, was what they, they believe was expanded to 36 feet across, the top and 15 feet high, large enough to accommodate a large number of sacrifices simultaneously. The ground beneath the altar was filled with caverns and canals and tunnels that would drain the blood away from the area into the valleys and into outside the city. And today, visitors at the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem can see 
a large cave beneath the rock uh, where many scholars believe that the altar rested. And all of that wasn't enough. They had to keep on every day and every year. The blood of the animals was okay for a short period of time until the next day where the next animal had to be slaughtered until the next year that the next animal had to be slaughtered. If God did not come in the flesh, then there is no blood for remission of sin, no sacrifice of atonement. The the purpose of the incarnation was to provide a holy human, not a second divine person in a trinity. He was the mediator between the holy God and a sinful humanity. It says in 1 Timothy 2 and 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, and that man is Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 1 and 18 says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So I'm hurrying, hurrying, trying to hurry to a close. Atonement often used as the equivalent of, equivalent of uh, reconciliation or it basically it just means to be at peace with or uh, peace with God it is to cause the alienation to cease and to overcome and do away with the hindrance that caused separation and thus to be brought into harmony Atonement changes the the judicial status from one of condemnation to one of justification. For us to be reconciled to God, the first step is God's, not man's. Nothing mankind can ever do will pay the price of sin that banishes us from God's presence. God makes the first move by providing a vehicle that reconciliation can take place. Then a person, as I said earlier on, then a person can respond to the opportunity that God has provided. Only through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross can we be reconciled back to Him. Sin contaminated the blood of mankind. The bloodline of all humankind is inherited from Adam and thus carries the guilt of sin within it. And without the shedding of the sinless blood or of the man who is sinless, the sinless blood, there, then no one else could have paid the price. Because though Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, He did not inherit the tainted bloodline of Adam which was contaminated by the blood or by the guilt of sin Jesus Christ's blood was pure and sinless and he came and offered himself so that sinless lamb this blood could come to a Sunday morning service and be applied on your life he was the substitute substitute Romans 5 9 through 11 says it this way but much more than that being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life and not only so but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. There. As sin separates us from God. We had to have. As I've said so many times. I'm driving it in here this morning. To put us back in line with him. Remission of sins is much more than just forgiveness. It involves the doing away. The removal of sins. And when we receive the remission of sins. It is as if all records in heaven of our sins are purged of any mention of their existence. I can't fathom that. When I go in the waters of baptism, 
my sins are erased. I might remember him, but to God, they're as far as the east is from the west. Our sins are not just forgiven, they are forgotten, gone, removed, done away with, and therefore non-existent. But something is necessary in order for individuals to take advantage of Jesus' universal sacrifice. That something involves, first of all, faith. Faith. Faith in God. First of all, we have to respond. And accept that God has forgiven us. Claim the sacrifice for ourselves. And then the blood must be applied. We don't need to pray, Lord, do something to save the lost. He already has done it. He's done everything necessary on his part to provide salvation. But humankind's free will and choice requires individual, individuals to respond to his provision through faith and repentance, first of all. And then as we know, the scripture in Acts chapter 2 says we must repent of our sins and then we must be baptized fully immersed buried with Jesus in the waters of baptism fully immersed in the water with the name of Jesus being commanded over our life for the remission of sins it doesn't just happen you play a part in this it's not just asking God into your heart. Come into my heart and you make it to heaven. I got to tell you the truth this morning. That's a great start. I'm not knocking it. I'm not knocking that prayer at all. Please don't misunderstand me. It is a wonderful, whenever I hear that prayer prayed at, at denominal churches around what, that I've been to, I say, thank God someone's made a step towards you. Thank God. Now I pray that they will see the full, the full, the full, the full salvation in your word. I pray that they would read your word and see it. Because God can show it. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care if it's Trinitarian, what, whatever. God can show a person in that church his plan. Just as he can show someone in this church his plan. You say, well, I, I need to go to that church down there. I didn't say that. You need to be in a Bible-believing-based church. As, well, that's another message. But you have to be buried with Him, baptized for this blood to be bought, or for the remission of sins. If I could go on and just, I could go on and talk about the cleansing process and and, and the things that they had to do with washing in the Old Testament and how it's a perfect example of what happens in the New Testament. If I had time, I could go through all of that. I don't, I don't have time this morning. But it's a perfect example of what happens in the New Testament when we are cleansed from sin. I'm here to tell you that this washing of this blood lasts. And it not only cleanses one time, but it will continue to cleanse. People have asked me, what well, do I need to be rebaptized?" I say, well, have you been baptized in the name of Jesus? Have you been baptized the right way? Have you been fully immersed? Then if you've been baptized the right way, you don't need to be baptized again because His blood still flows to you. His blood still flows in your life. His blood is still there. What can wash away my sin? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hananias, come on. Get up. Stop tearing. 
Be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. I'm wondering this morning, does anyone need a fresh washing in the blood today? Does anyone need to be washed in his blood for the very first time? I'm not talking about any kind of blood. But I'm talking about this blood. At the end of this message, I felt... God speak to me this past week and share with me something to share with each of us in this congregation. And now I'm talking to this, to our, to us, not to a church down the street, not to anyone else, but to this church. When people look at this church, I don't want them to see a room of perfect people. And that we have it all together. Now, don't get me wrong. I preached last week on the way we should live our life. But when a picture is taken of this church, I don't want it to be a clean, sterile picture because that means there's no growth. If everyone here looks like they just stepped out of General Conference of the United Pentecostal Church, then Houston, we have a problem. Yes, I want this church to be a church of holiness and separation, but let us never forget that we were once a sinner. Let us never forget that we were once in someone else's shoes. That we were the first time guests needing a change in, my, in our life. That we were the imperfect person far from God. I'm up here to declare that I'm not scared or embarrassed when people see an imperfect church. Because I'm an imperfect person. I'm not scared or embarrassed if people talk and say, oh look at that. A church that has a whole range of people and issues and problems. I'm not worried about the gossip and the talk saying, well, do they really believe any longer? I'm not worried about the perfect looking picture. I pray that we don't have the perfect looking picture because we might think too highly of ourselves and forget more. That is, And we forget that we think it's more about the outside than it's about the blood. I don't want to be full of dead man's bones on the inside when they see first born ministries I want them to say wow they have some messy people there I don't say that in a condescending way or a hurtful way because sometimes my life is just messy it's messy messy I want this church to be a place where people who are messed up and dirty can come to and find hope in this blood I have been talk that, that I've been talking about. I want them to feel like they belong here. I pray that there isn't one person that leaves and says, I can't be a part of that church because I could never be like this person. We all have our personal walks with God. I don't want to leave some, I don't want someone to leave here because someone said something, maybe even in a loving way, that causes hurt feelings. Help us, Lord. Lord, to consider your blood and sacrifice when we try and help others. I want this to be a place that someone can say, I might not have it all together, but I know of a place I can go to and feel loved. I can be feel loved by God. I can feel loved by people. And they will take me just as I am and lead me to a God who wants me to be who He wants me to be. We serve a God that can stitch change a messy and dirty situation that stinks and someone who feels like they are going nowhere in their life and when the blood hits their life 
when the blood hits their life it covers their life and something begins to change the stink is washed away the dirt is cleansed and hope enters the room I'm not ashamed that every time I'm in this pulpit I talk about hope because I'm a hope dealer I'm a hope dealer I'm a hope dealer This church is going to have growth and not just swelling because swelling eventually goes away but growth and not just small growth but mighty growth. Get ready. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be pretty. But if we put our trust in this blood of Jesus that washes us white as snow. And if we really truly trust that the Holy Ghost really changes somebody, and if we trust that the Holy Ghost will move and work in someone's life, and the person will see the change that they desperately need, when we remember where we, are, where we were at in life, we will have the grace for others. And so I come this morning to tell each of us, get ready because it might be crazy around here. It might look a lot different, but God is doing something in some Someone's life, and I claim and plead the blood, and I trust in the blood, the blood that covers, the blood that changes. I can't change anyone, but this blood can change someone in just a moment, in just an eye blink. This blood, this blood, this blood, this blood. And so I want us to pray a special prayer at the end of this service. That God will bring people out of the woodworks. That God will convict backsliders. That they won't worry about where they're at in their life and what people will think about them. That they won't worry that someone's going to look down upon them. But that they will feel the love of God as it goes to them. And pleads on their behalf. Can we lift up our voice right now and ask God to send and bring someone back to this house? There are people who have gone away from this place and they feel like they can't come back. I pray that that is the work of the enemy. And the enemy has been defeated. We stand upon the blood of Jesus Christ. We stand upon love of Jesus Christ. Oh, come on. Why don't you plead for someone that you know this morning? Why don't you lift up your voice for someone you know this morning? Oh, Jesus. Jesus. I pray that the conviction power of God rests upon this place. If you're here this morning and you felt God moving on your life, Holy Ghost, I need you. I need you. And you felt God pulling and prodding you this morning. These altars are open, but it's not just for a sinner. This altar is not just for someone who messed up. Don't ever feel like you're coming up here and people are looking at you like you did something wrong. That's not what this altar is here for. This altar is no more than just for a sinner. It's for a saint. Come on, buddy. Come on. Come here. This guy's following after God. In the name of Jesus, touch this young man.
It's his will that we become like that little child. That little child feels the love of God on his heart. And he came up here tonight, this morning, because he feels God pleading with him. I don't know how old he is. He's young. He might not even understand what happened here. But he felt something. And I know other people are in this room and you feel something on your life. I'm asking you to step out of your seat and to come to an altar. Again, I, like I was saying, it's not for just the sinner. It's for the saint. It's for every single one of us. It's to receive strength. Don't feel like if you come up here that people are looking down on you. I'm asking that we would all come to an altar and that we would all recommit our lives once again as that little child. I'm asking that all of us would step out of our seats and come to an altar and plead the blood on our life once again I'm asking all of us to plead this blood on our families, on our city I'm asking all of us to ask God to remit your sins once again to ask God to bring his blood once again to your life come on that's it Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, we are claiming things in this house this morning. We're claiming this blood, this blood, blood.
nothing but the blood, and nothing but the blood of Jesus. I said it's nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm proud of this young man right here. Pastor loves you. I'm proud of him. He has faith. In the name of Jesus, touch his legs, Lord. In Jesus' name. This message, as I close this service, was born out of this story. And I share this with us at the end of this service. There's a story that came out a couple of months ago entitled The Man with the Golden Arm. The story of a man named James Harrison, and when he was 14, he got really sick. One of his lungs had to be removed, and he needed a lot of blood. He said, I was in the hospital for three months, and I had 100 stitches. After receiving 13 units, almost two gallons of donated blood, Harrison knew right away that he wanted to give back. I was always looking forward to donating right from the op- right from that operation because I don't know how many people it took to save my life, he said. I never met them. I didn't know them. At that time, Australia's law required blood donors to be at least 18 years old. He lives in Australia. And it would be four years before Harrison was eligible, but he vowed then that when he became 18, he would be a blood donor. Sure enough, at 18, on his birthday, he went to the Australian Red Cross Blood Service. He disliked needles, so he averted his eyes and tried to ignore the pain whenever one was inserted into his arm. Harrison gave blood and plasma regularly every three weeks or so for 11 straight years. Meanwhile, doctors were struggling with cases of potentially fatal condition called RH incompatibility, also known as RH disease. It occurs when a woman, a pregnant woman, has an RH negative blood type, but the fetus she is carrying is a RH positive blood type. In some pregnant women, RH disease causes their antibodies to attack the fetus red blood cells. And in Australia, up until 1977, there were literally thousands of babies dying each and every year. Doctors didn't know why, and it was awful. Women were having numerous miscarriages and babies were being born with brain damage. Doctors realized, however, that it might be possible to prevent this, this injecting with injecting the pregnant woman with a treatment made from a donated plasma with a rare antibody. Re- researchers uh, scoured blood, blood banks to see whose blood might contain an antibody. And they found one person, one man. Named James Harrison. By then, Harrison had been de- donating blood regularly for more than a decade. He didn't. Uh, he said he didn't think twice when scientists reached out to him to ask if he would participate in what has now become known as the Anti D program. They asked him to be a guinea pig, and I've donated ever since. Scientists needed a way to turn this reaction off, and in Harrison's blood, they found a rare antibody known as the RHD immune, or the anti-D. Doctors believe Harrison had this anti-D because of the blood he received at age 14. Isn't that amazing? And so Harrison became the first anti-D donor in Australia, and the most prolific. He's in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most blood ever donated. And he is known with the man, the man, he is known as the man with the golden arm. An ample of anti-D ever made in Australia has James' name on it. Every single anti-D drug has James in it. He has saved millions of babies. He has saved millions of babies. Scientists aren't sure why Harrison's body naturally produces the rare antibody but they think it's related again to the blood transfusion he received as a teenager he said I've been donated for 60 years because I just wanted to give something back but now at this point it's estimated that he has saved 2.4 million babies including his own grandson Scott 
And in 2011, when Scott turned 16, uh, he made his first donation, sitting right next to his grandfather, who was making his 1,000th donation at age 81. The government made him hang up the tubes and needles and retire from donation just a, a couple of months ago. But the lives of many unborn children have been saved because of this blood. The countless lives, the millions have been saved because Jesus came to this earth and he died and he shed his blood so that you and I might be saved so that you and I might be healed so that you and I might be delivered so that you and I blood of Jesus on our family can plead the blood of Jesus on our children can plead the blood of Jesus on our church and so I walk out of here this morning saying this blood is the blood that I plead this blood is the blood that I call for this blood is the blood that continues to save my body that continues to heal my body and so I walk out of here saying I plead I plead the blood I plead I plead the blood in my situation, in my family, in my home. I plead the blood. Hey. And when you realize that this blood is everything you need, you can walk out of here with your head held high and victory in your heart and saying, I plead, I plead the blood. Well, I plead, I plead the blood. God bless you this morning. I plead, I plead the blood. Well, I plead, I plead the blood. You're dismissing Jesus' name. I plead, I plead the blood. I plead the blood. Oh, I plead, I plead the blood. I plead, I plead the blood. Oh, I plead, I plead the blood. 